Thank you, President Bateman, for introducing me and for allowing me the privilege of introducing two Brigham Young University students who will provide an a cappella vocal duet to set the stage for my remarks and for giving others. David and Michael Fouts will sing, Lord, I Would Follow Thee, a hymn that highlights our need to emulate the Savior, and in particular our need to refrain from judging unrighteously, to heal and comfort. David and Michael are brothers and direct lineal descendants of Bishop Jacob Fouts, who was shot and left for dead at the Hans Mill Massacre in Missouri in October 1838. According to an account written by Jacob's wife, Margaret Mann Fouts, after the massacre, Jacob and another brother survived by drawing dead bodies over themselves and feigning death. Margaret records that these two men thus, quote, saved their own lives and heard what some of the mob said. After the firing was over, two little boys that were in the blacksmith shop begged for their lives. But one of the mob said, Nits will make lice, meaning they will make Mormons and he put the muzzle of the gun to the boys' heads and ended their lives." Unquote. After Margaret found Jacob, she got him home and eventually assisted him in removing a bullet from his hip with a kitchen knife. She applied a poultice to his wound and disguised him in women's clothes to trick the murderous mob when it returned to exterminate male survivors. Though physically scarred for life, Jacob did survive, and what is most important, he thrived spiritually. He was called as a bishop in Nauvoo, served a mission in Pennsylvania, and moved west with the saints in 1847, continuing to serve as a bishop until his premature death the following year. Although Bishop Fouts sought legal redress for the financial losses he suffered at Hans Mill, he did not allow the poisonous venom of hate and vengeance to destroy his spiritual life. Instead, he bequeathed to posterity, to his posterity, a legacy of faith and forgiveness that continues to the present generation. David Fouts serves as first counselor in my bishopric, and the hymn that he and his brother will now perform honors the memory of their progenitor and all the pioneers who forgave their persecutors and moved on geographically and spiritually to establish a new life in Zion.
Savior, may I learn to love my brother as I know thou lovest me. This was a hard lesson for me to learn. Twenty-five years ago, I completed my freshman year at BYU. At that time, I never dreamed that I would one day address the faculty and student body in a Marriott Center devotional. For one thing, the Marriott Center didn't even exist. For another, I was a Latter-day Saint convert of less than two years and didn't feel overly confident in my ability to expound on church doctrine. But I did feel prompted to embark on a full-time mission. I had baptized my best friend, also a BYU student, earlier in the school year, and I was anxious to share the restored gospel with others. Before I could serve, however, I had to submit to that rite of passage familiar to all who would serve missions. I had to have interviews with my bishop and stake president, fill out several forms, undergo medical and dental examinations, make financial arrangements, and attend to a variety of academic concerns. In preparation for my mission, I reread LeGrand Richards' A Marvelous Work in a Wonder and read James E. Talmadge's Jesus the Christ. I also tackled Talmadge's The Articles of Faith. With the zeal of a convert, I had previously read Joseph Fielding Smith's three-volume work, Doctrines of Salvation, and much of Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine. I had a vivid dream in which I saw myself called to Italy, where centuries before St. Paul had journeyed to preach to the Romans. When the call came, I was thrilled. The opening sentence of the letter read, You are hereby called to be a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to labor in the Italy North Mission. My dream had come true. Because I came from a non-LDS family, I could not rely on them for financial support. I elected to pay for my mission with funds I had previously set aside for my college education. I looked forward to my mission as one long spiritual feast Mine was to be the ideal missionary experience. I would love my companions. I would teach the gospel daily by word and deed, and I would baptize regularly. <laughs> After I had been in Italy for only four months, I was called as a senior companion to a brand new elder, a greenie, whom I'll call Elder Brown. Proud of the linguistic skills that allowed me to enter a senior position after so few months in a foreign land, the emphasis here being on proud, I looked forward to remaking Elder Brown in my own image, never minding that he was much more handsome and more personable than I. Unfortunately, things didn't work out exactly as I had planned. Elder Brown came from LDS Pioneer Stock and a much more well-to-do family. His grandfather invariably included a $20 bill in his letters. I resented the perks that such extra cash allowed, even though my companion invariably shared the bounty with me. Elder Brown had belonged to a social fraternity during his freshman year, the type that never would have accepted a nerd such as I. And unfortunately, his fraternity brothers had exposed him to a number of undesirable things, including risque magazines. Then it happened. One afternoon, during scripture study time in our apartment, I caught him reading, if that's the right word, an unapproved magazine, you know, the kind with a centerfold. It was an Italian edition of Playboy. He had purchased it while on splits with another elder, and I was furious. I felt that Elder Brown had ruined my ideal mission. I seethed in righteous indignation. But rather than rebuking my companion and then showing forth an increase in love, I chose to become an expert on his every fault, which I cataloged and reviewed with some regularity in my mind. <laughs> After a few months together, my junior companion was mercifully transferred. And it was at that point that I began my revenge in earnest. I've always been fond of telling stories, in case you haven't noticed. And I soon captivated not only later missionary companions, but entire districts with embroidered tales of my greeny, sinful ways. Even after I returned from my mission, I continued to recount his problems. The one thing that I couldn't understand, however, was the report that I'd received from more than one source that Elder Brown, in contrast to me, had become one of the top baptizing elders of our mission and had been called to key leadership positions that had mysteriously eluded me. A few years passed. Then one day, Elder Brown appeared on my doorstep. He asked to come in. We spoke alone for over an hour in my living room. I asked what he was doing and learned that he was happily married and an extremely successful businessman and entrepreneur. Because of the way I had stereotyped him, I wondered about his activity in the church. I was surprised to learn that he was not an elder, as was I, but a high priest and serving on a high council. He then stunned me 
by relating how his favorite High Council talk was to share what he had learned from me while we were mission companions. He loved to tell young people preparing for missions how much better prepared doctrinally I, the convert, had been than he, the lifelong member, and how my example of gospel scholarship had inspired him to overcome his own shortcomings. I began to feel pretty rotten about all the stories I told about him. I prayed that he didn't know what I had done, but somehow I sensed that he did know. He then acknowledged that at a family reunion, one of his cousins, whom I had known in graduate school, had told him how I had recounted in her presence and in vivid detail an episode Elder Brown had long ago repented of. My former companion did not berate me. Instead, he asked if I could ever forgive him for his youthful mistakes. I knew then that it was I who needed to ask for forgiveness. In the pride of my heart, I had sinned, and I had sinned in multiple ways, in judging unmercifully, in harboring resentment, in planning and executing revenge, and perhaps most of all, in not allowing the possibility that a brother could change, improve, and repent. Savior, may I love my brother as I know thou lovest me. I could not see the mote in my brother's eye because of the beam in my own. I had chosen to ignore the fundamental law of repentance taught by the Lord and modern-day prophets. We must forgive in order to be forgiven. Of this principle, the scriptures are clear. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. As a Protestant growing up in the Bible Belt, I recited the Lord's Prayer by memory almost every Sunday. What I failed to realize as a child, as a teenager, and even as a missionary was that the words, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, really means, Father, do not forgive me one iota more than I am willing to forgive others. The Apostle Peter inquired long ago, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus answered, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Some of us are unwilling to accept that seventy times seven does not mean, in this context, a precise number. Keep track of grudges, vainly nursing them and hoping that when the magic number of 490 comes along, <laughs> we can stop forgiving altogether. We forget not a hurt, we forget not a grudge, we forget not an offense. What we do forget is the fifth beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We forget the example of the first Christian martyr Stephen who cried as he was stoned, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. We disregard the counsel of Paul to, quote, forgive one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We ignore the example of the Savior on the cross who pleaded, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we're speaking of serious sins, the Savior's phrase, they know not what they do, has raised the question in some minds as, whether to, as to whether the injunction to forgive includes forgiving those who know exactly what they do and choose to do evil nonetheless. Modern-day revelation boldly proclaims that saints of the Most High God must forgive in order to be forgiven. Doctrine and Covenant section 64 clearly teaches that we, quote, ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the greater sin. The passage continues, I the Lord will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. President Spencer W. Kimball, extending this idea, preached that Quote, unless a person forgives his brother his trespasses with all his heart, he is unfit to partake of the sacrament. What is the Lord asking us to do? What does it mean to forgive another person, his or her trespasses? The first recorded use of the verb forgive in the King James Bible occurs in Genesis 15:17 and helps answer these questions. There we read that the dying words of Jacob to his son Joseph who had been sold as a slave into Egypt by his brothers, were an acknowledgment of the evil done and a request for mercy. Father, sorry, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, 
for they did unto the evil. Wherever after the brothers confessed their sin to Joseph, and now we, thy brethren, pray thee, Joseph, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. This confession is followed by a description of Joseph's softened heart, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Joseph's reaction is telling of his magnanimous character. Nevertheless, he first reprimands his brothers and then forgives, telling them, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. To forgive another does not imply to disregard judgment. Certainly forgiving another does not mean that we hold in contempt the law of justice. In fact, Doctrine and Covenants 6411 argues that one who forgives should embrace judgment and hold the transgressor, especially, I would argue, the serious offender, accountable for what he or she has done. Verse 11 states unequivocally, And ye ought to say in your hearts, Let God judge between me, the offended, and thee, the offender, and reward thee according to thy deeds. This latter phrase echoes the words of St. Paul regarding one who had done him much evil. The apostle prays that, quote, the Lord reward him according to his works, unquote. And this should be our prayer as well, but it must be a prayer uttered not in hatred, not in bitterness, but rather as moved upon by the Holy Ghost. To forgive a serious offense, in other words, is to turn in faith to God, to pray that he will help the offender repent, and to allow God to judge and reward. It means to accept humbly God's righteous judgment with faith, hope, and comfort, with joy and peace. I repeat, the concept of judgment is not jettisoned overboard by the commandment to forgive even serious offenders. Rather, to forgive is to turn over to God the ultimate right to judge, and if the offender refuses to repent, to allow him, God, to decree the final punishment. As Amulek witnessed to Zeazrim, not even God can save sinners in their sins. But how do we find the courage and inspiration to forgive our brothers his trespasses? As a young adult ward bishop, I conducted during my first three years of service approximately 3,000 personal tithing settlement and ecclesiastical endorsement interviews. Long before the 3,000th interview, I realized that many individuals who had gone through formal steps of repentance still did not feel forgiven. In many cases, the only reason for their not feeling forgiven stemmed for their not having forgiven themselves or others their trespasses. Keeping in mind that forgiveness of others is a step in the repentance process helps many to find the strength to forgive. I've also discovered that true stories of forgiveness are a powerful medium for teaching this principle. Inspiring stories of mercy can be found in literature, in church and world history, and in testimonies of living Latter-day Saints. Time limitations have forced me to limit my selections today to a handful of examples that I have found particularly meaningful. In modern history, perhaps no more atrocious crime has been committed than the Holocaust, the systematic murder of millions of Jews political prisoners, handicapped persons, and others by Nazis, the Nazi regime. Corrie ten Boom, a Christian political prisoner, survived the concentration camp at Ravensbrück, but her beloved sister Betsy did not survive. After the war, Corrie traveled the world preaching sermons of reconciliation, peace, and forgiveness. Then it happened. She was called upon to practice what she preached. She records in her autobiography The Hiding Place, the defining moment of her Christian discipleship. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. 
Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. This story is instructive to Latter-day Saints because it dramatizes that in difficult cases we must call upon Christ to grant us his love and his forgiveness, for we cannot do it alone. I now desire to share with you three short but poignant accounts of forgiveness, all written at my invitation by BYU faculty members for this devotional. These accounts have never been published. They are highly personal stories of dear friends, colleagues whom I love and admire. When I think of them, I know that Brigham Young University stands on sacred ground because their presence helps to hallow it. I originally intended for these teachers to stand, come to this podium, and narrate their own stories. All declined out of modesty, stating that their reason for agreeing to record their stories arose from a desire to help those who are struggling to forgive another. Brothers and sisters, I do not wish to offend anyone here, but I need to say that from my work on the University Self-Study Committee, I know firsthand that there are departments and individuals on this campus where divisiveness is more common than forgiveness. There are departments where colleagues are quick to judge and slow to forgive. Perhaps a faculty member here today carries a grudge, having been hurt by a careless remark or wrongful act of a colleague. Perhaps you know of someone who has been hurt and refuses to forgive, someone who is allowing a wound to fester. Or perhaps someone here has been offended by a roommate or teammate, brother or sister, mother or father, husband or wife, son or daughter, boyfriend or girlfriend, student or professor, department chair or administrator, ward member or bishop, boss or employee, or even state president or general authority. Whether the offense is perceived as intentional or unintentional, willed or not, if it is troubling your mind or cankering your soul, then the faculty accounts I'm about to share are meant not only for me, but for you as well. My first account has a name attached to it because it treats someone who is the recipient of another's tender mercy, someone who learned to forgive by being forgiven himself. Larry Dahl is an associate dean of religion on this campus. Several years ago when he was my bishop, he shared with a group of ward members a stirring lesson from his childhood. This is Larry Dahl's story. When I was five years old, two friends and I made ourselves a hideout by tunneling into a haystack alongside a new barn in the neighbor's yard, then digging out a spacious room right in the middle of the haystack. We delighted in our secret meeting place. One day, we decided to roast some hot dogs. Since our home was right next door, I secured the matches to light a fire. You can imagine the rest of the story. The fire quickly got away from us. We scampered through the tunnel to safety, and all three of us ran to our separate homes. I don't know what the others did, but I immediately went to my upstairs bedroom and climbed into bed, panic-stricken. Within minutes, I heard the wail of the town fire truck getting closer and closer, but it was too late. The haystack and the new barn were quickly consumed. Fortunately, however, someone arrived soon enough to get the animals out of the barn. Somehow my parents suspected I may have had something to do with the fire since they knew of our hideout. Not seeing me anywhere in the neighborhood, they searched the house. As I heard their footsteps on the stairs, I thought my pounding heart would jump right out of my body. When they entered the bedroom and witnessed my fearful and tearful face, their suspicions were confirmed. Mother just sat on the edge of the bed and held me. My father asked me to tell them what had happened. Through broken-hearted sobs, I recited the events of the afternoon. He quietly left the room while my mother stayed and cried with me. I learned years later that my father paid our neighbor for the hay and the barn. But from the day it happened to the day of his death, 45 years later, my father never mentioned the event to me. Truly it was as if he did not remember it. 
There's a coda or postscript to Brother Dahl's story, and it treats a role reversal that he experienced when he became a father. He writes, Many years later, when our two oldest boys were five and seven, they broke a window playing ball in the yard. My first impulse was to be upset and scold them. My sweet wife, knowing the story of my own five-year-old ventures, gently intervened. She said simply, Windows are not nearly as expensive as barns. <laughs> the principle that this story illustrates is simple but often ignored by those who need to forgive. True forgiveness implies not mentioning past sins, errors, or mistakes once they've been properly dealt with. In five-year-old Larry's case, he needed to express sorrow and to confess and accept responsibility for his careless and damaging act. But once that was accomplished, he could do little more as a kindergartner to restore the burned-down barn. And so a loving father paid the price for Larry's mistake and mentioned it to him no more. The scriptures teach that he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. Brother Dahl, through his personal account and writings, has helped me see that this principle is best understood in light of what the prophet Ezekiel taught. If a sinner, quote, will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Furthermore, all his transgressions that he hath committed shall not be mentioned unto him. While it seems obvious that the Lord can recall to memory anything from our past, in fact, we know from the scriptures that when we repeat our sins, the former sins return, it is apparent from Ezekiel that the Lord's promise to remember no more of the sins we've repented of means that he will remember them to us no more. If the Lord will no longer remember to us the transgressions we repent of, then surely it is incumbent upon us to allow others the same opportunity. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland captured this idea in his recent conference talk when he stated, Closely related to our own obligation to repent is the generosity of letting others do the same. We are to forgive even as we are forgiven. Or as President Spencer W. Kimball captured this principle, he who will not forgive others breaks down the bridge over which he himself must travel. The next faculty account I share deals with a much more serious act than barn burning. It has to do with someone forgiving someone else who killed a wife and a child. Though the heinous act did not contain the element of intention inherent in the sin we call murder, the result was the same. A loving husband lost his companion and infant daughter, and a four-year-old son was robbed of a mother and baby sister. A colleague, who now serves as a campus ward bishop, shared his story in these moving words. In a late evening of August, we were beginning an 11-hour drive from Cody, Wyoming to Salt Lake to support our mother who was worried about my father's open heart surgery. We were close as a family and felt a strong need to be together. My older brother was driving. His wife was sitting next to him, sitting next to him and to my youngest brother who occupied the front window seat. My wife was behind my driving brother holding our 18-month-old daughter and I was on the opposite side with our four-year-old son stretched out on the seat, his head in my lap. I woke from a half-sleep to see headlights crossing the road to our side, my brother swerving to avoid head-on contact. Swerving helped, but there was contact nonetheless, and it changed my life and my son's life forever. The left side of the car had received the most damage, my wife and daughter having absorbed the major portion of the shock. While my daughter died later that night in the hospital, my wife took an entire week before she could finally go. Everyone was hurt but me while I was alone in assessing the damage, praying for a saving car to happen by in the loneliness of the Wind River Canyon and then walking toward the other damaged car. I was immediately offended by an overwhelming stench of alcohol. I briefly checked and found the 19-year-old driver of the other car incoherent from drink but otherwise unharmed. I was later told after the police arrived that he had tried to find me to fight me since he thought I would be angered by what he had done. Eventually he did find me and drunkenly asked me to forgive him for what he had done that night. I certainly had not prepared myself for such a request. My immediate thought was that if I did say I would forgive him, I would have to do it since I would not play games with my mind and my heart given the incomprehensible changes of my newly defined life. I could not say no. I told him flatly that I forgave him and I meant it. In honesty, I must say that I've never wanted to be his buddy or pal. Indeed, I cannot even remember his name, nor do I know where he is now. 
but I will be eternally grateful for his asking for forgiveness that Saturday morning before dawn because, in complying, I was freed from the thrall of anger and hate that otherwise could have brought even greater sorrow into my life. From this tragedy, I think I learned something new. Forgiveness brings true and genuine freedom, often to the forgiven, but always and without exception to the forgiver. This fine brother shared with me his conviction that he never would have been called as a bishop had he refused the invitation to forgive. How could he speak on behalf of the Lord's Church and bear testimony to a penitent ward member that he or she was forgiven if he himself had never been willing to forgive? The drunken driver in this story was, of course, tried in a civil court and will one day stand, account stand accountable before God for his actions. Remember, brothers and sisters, our forgiveness of others does not remove their own need to repent and pay the penalty or penalties for their sins. As Elder Richard G. Scott has written, the sweetness of spirit that follows forgiveness is absolutely essential to our daily growth process, but the requirement to forgive often sends wrong signals to the offender, such as, you must forgive me, and when you have, my offense no longer exists. Forgiveness on the part of the offended blesses the life of the offender and greatly assists the healing process but it must never be taken as the resolution to a transgression which has not been given the proper steps of repentance." Unquote. While we must forgive all the Lord, while we must forgive all, the Lord will forgive only the truly repentant. My final account was written by a female faculty member who is a convert to the Church. It is a story of abuse and, what is more important, recovery from abuse. Abuse comes in many forms, including neglect, improper care, and abandonment as well as verbal, mental, physical, spiritual, and sexual abuse. If anyone within the sound of my voice has suffered such abuse, I urge you to seek professional help and spiritual counsel. Recovery from abuse is a process that can take considerable time, much emotional energy, and deep faith. Forgiveness must be a goal of that recovery process, for as one LDS psychologist has written, forgiveness is an opportunity to regain the internal peace of which evil has robbed us. This is the final faculty story I wish to share with you today. It is one person's story of healing, of finding peace through forgiveness and gospel ordinances. Alcohol addiction robbed my father of his wife, his four children, his job, his mother, and finally his life. Alcoholism doomed my parents' marriage from the beginning. On the very first Christmas, Daddy got drunk and broke all the lights on the tree. My mother stayed with him for 19 years anyway, hoping to save the marriage for the sake of the children. I left home during my senior year of high school because I could not bear to witness the violence anymore. When Mommy saw that Daddy's problem was destroying her children, she divorced him. We wanted to love our dad, but he was often not himself. Under the bondage of alcohol, he was moody, physically violent, and verbally abusive. One time he kicked my brother with his steel-toed military boots. My brother was so badly bruised that he would not dress out for his PE class at school. He got in trouble because the teacher did not know about our family background. We lived in terror. We never knew when Daddy would be sober, when he would be drunk. We felt relieved when he was gone. We suffered the consequence of Daddy's curse in different ways, but we all tried to forgive him. At the age of 18, I found peace and forgiveness in the doctrines and ordinances of the gospel. A year after the death of my father, I arranged for my home teachers to be the proxies for his temple work. Before my mission, I gathered all the family history documents from my grandpa's house. After my mission, I started doing the temple work for my father's family. In 1979, I did the temple work for my grandma and felt her gratitude. The following year, I went to the temple with some of my family home evening brothers and sisters. We were proxies as my father was sealed to his parents. I cried, and the brother who did the sealing said that the spirits of my family members were present. Temple work is the key to family healing and forgiveness. Doing the temple work for my father helped to set him free from bondage, which helped to set his parents free. Doing temple work also sets me free, one name at a time. This sister knew more hurt in the span of her first two decades of life than many of us will ever know. But through the Atonement of Christ, the plan of salvation, and the act of forgiveness, she has come to know that peace which surpasseth all understanding. This is the peace that living the gospel brings. She understands what it means to sing, Savior, may I love my Father, as I know thou lovest me. 
In the end, we must arrive at the point where we can pray sincerely that the offender will repent, for our forgiveness does not ensure the Lord's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is conditional. It is based on true, sincere, genuine repentance. As Spencer Kimball taught us, even the Lord will not forgive a person in his sins. I close with a poem composed by Marguerite Stewart. It is entitled, Forgiveness Flower, spelled F-L-O-U-R, flower. The poem written in the first person features an unnamed wife who answers her door to find a young woman in shame and seeking flour, which symbolizes forgiveness, to make bread. The poem reads, When I went to the door at the whisper of knocking, I saw Simeon Gantner's daughter Kathleen standing there in her shawl and her shame, sent to ask forgiveness flour for her bread. Forgiveness flour, we call it in our corner. If one has erred, one is sent to ask for flour of his neighbors. If they loan it to him, that means he can stay. But if they refuse, he had best take himself off. I looked at Kathleen. What a jewel of a daughter, though not, not much like her father, more's the pity. I'll give you flour, I said, and went to measure it. Measuring was the rub. If I gave too much, neighbors would think I made sin easy. But if I gave too little, they would label me close. While I stood measuring, Joel, my husband, came in from the mill, a great bag of flour on his shoulder, and seeing her there, shrinking in the doorway, he tossed the bag at her feet. Here, take all of it. And so she had flour for many loaves, while I stood measuring. The phrase, while I stood measuring, characterizes too many of us too much of the time. We metaphorically measure flour in an attempt not to be overgenerous in our mercy. At the same time, we pray that God will throw a bag of flour at our feet, that is, that He will be boundless in, him, in His mercy towards us. One month ago, the First Presidency issued a letter to church leaders in Utah County in anticipation of the Mount Timpanogos Temple dedication. President Hinckley and his counselors urged the saints in this area, quote, to use this occasion to cleanse their lives of anything that is displeasing to the Lord, eliminating from their hearts any ill feelings of envy or enmity, and seeking forgiveness for anything that is amiss in their lives. My prayer today is that the forgiveness we seek is large enough to include the forgiveness not only of ourselves, but also of others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.